Today I fucked up by trying to add novelty lobster oven mitts to my wedding registry. And now I am rethinking things. What? I, 24 year old male, met my fiance, 26 female, in college about six years ago. We were instant sweethearts who bonded over both feeling out of place at this fancy California state school we ended up at. Things have been going decently well for years and I love her very, very much. Now, my fiance has always had some unique quirks. She also has been diagnosed with anxiety disorder and is from rural Idaho, so maybe I was giving her the benefit of the doubt a little bit too much. Something I have been slightly aware of is the fact that my fiance has always been a little weird around black people. Oh no. I am white and so is she, but I was adopted into a black family when I was little, so my whole extended family is black. My best friend, okay. who I'll call Tim, is also black. We grew up in the same city and were roommates for the first two years of college. My fiance has never liked Tim, despite him being my childhood best friend and someone who is clearly important to me. She always said that Tim is too loud or too rude to her, or that she doesn't like the way he smells. She always Jesus. tried to get me to hang out with her other friends over Tim, which now I'm realizing they were always white friends. Mm. She even suggested that I have her best friend's boyfriend as my best man over Tim. At the time, all of these things registered as weird, of course. But, as I said, he's very naturally quirky, who does strange things sometimes. Those racists are naturally quirky. <laughs> he's just quirky. <laughs> what can I say? I told her that I still plan on having Tim as my best man. And that was that. Flash forward to today. And wedding planning has been going great. My three sisters, along with my fiance's best friend, are going to be bridesmaids. And my wife is supposed to pick out and order bridesmaid dresses by the end of the week. We've been having a ton of fun building our wedding registry. We have a nice house, but we are working on remodeling the kitchen, so most of our registry is kitchen stuff. Earlier today, I saw an ad for some hilarious but tasteful lobster oven mitts, and I grabbed my fiance's laptop to add them to our wedding registry. To my absolute horror, when I opened her computer, oh, no. the browser was open to a search along the lines of colors that make black Black women look ugly. Oh. I looked through her search history. What colors wash out dark skin? Worst bridesmaid dresses for dark skin women. Literally dozens of searches across these lines. I closed her laptop, put it back, but I feel like I may have to bring it up after she gets home this afternoon. I know it's her big day, but this is seriously raising some red flags. I feel like I'm going to throw up, but maybe I'm reading too far into things? Definitely talk to her because your whole family is black. You can't yeah. marry a racist. That's insane. All right, here's the update. I called my oldest sister, who I'm closest with, to try and get her read on this shit after reading the comments. Because I hadn't even considered that maybe she was trying to be helpful in some sort of backwards way by finding a flattering color or something. Interesting. But really, some of the wording of these searches feels really racially charged. So I have my doubts about it. My sisters have always had a better interactions with my fiance than Tim did and has never got the racist vibe from her either. But has always thought she was super weird. Like maybe the Zodiac killer kind of weird. <laughs> oh my God. When I was talking to my sister, she started cracking up and told me that my fiance had sent her picture of the bridesmaid dresses she was thinking of last night when she was searching all of this racist she chose the nastiest, most washed out beige yellow dress that I have ever seen. Edit two, talk to Tim. Tim has really changed my mind about a lot of this. There's been a few times where she's made unsavory comments, but he denies there ever being a time where she had made him really uncomfortable outside of some off color jokes. He's known my fiance for as long as I have, so he kind of gets the cards on the table. She can really work herself up and get paranoid, and maybe she was having an irrational moment moment when picking out the dresses. He said that he had no idea that my fiance even had a problem with him, which honestly kind of broke my heart. Tim's a great guy. I'm really, really hoping we can work this out. And here's edit three, which confirms all of our beliefs. Everything is off. It ended with us getting in a screaming match and her telling me to fuck off if I'd rather suck that N-word's than be with her. Oh, bitch. That's insane.
my father-in-law had a meltdown because I proved his he doesn't know his son. So me, 34 male, and my husband, 30 male, do our damnedest to not spend an abundance of time with my father-in-law. He's a cowardly narcissist who says hot dog unironically. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Ever since I came into the picture almost seven years ago, we have simply not meshed. A great deal of that is due to the fact that I've spent these years instilling confidence and boundary setting in husband. Father-in-law does not like being told no. We literally got kicked out of a restaurant one time because he couldn't accept that they wouldn't give him a discount. So needless to say, our interactions are nothing more than exchanging of fake pleasantries. So last mm. week, we're over there for our quarterly visit. The way these evenings typically go is that my husband occupies my father-in-law while my mother-in-law tests out her new English vocabulary on me. This time, my husband is doing the bulk of the talking to both of them because he's excited about the new organization he's working with. Father-in-law keeps trying to change the subject because it's been two seconds since the subject of the conversation was not about him. My husband and my mother-in-law both snap. I'm not entirely sure what they said as my Spanish is still terrible, but it's amounted to telling my father-in-law to shut the fuck up and listen. Mm -hmm. Father-in-law gets obstinate and essentially tells my husband that no matter what the organization is, it'll never compare to the work he did in his youth. Father-in-law literally just hiked through Central America with a white savior complex until things got violent and he came back home. My husband... <laughs> Gee. <laughs> what? My husband understandably storms out with my mother-in-law hot on his tail. Awkwardness ensues because I'm chuckling at father-in-law. Here's how the conversation goes. Father-in-law, he never spoke to me like that until you came along. Me, I know, I'm so proud. Father-in-law, you've changed him. Me, no, this is how he's always been. You've just never noticed it before. Father-in-law, I know my son. Oh yeah, what's his favorite color? What? What's his favorite color? Don't start stuttering now. It's the same one he's had as a kid. Nothing. Name two of his interests. This doesn't make any sense. Name them. Silence. Here's an easy one. What's the name of the organization he's working with? Father-in-law, mm. silence. Mm. This wannabe Bob Ross granola-eating motherfucker oh. <laughs> couldn't answer. My husband said the name of the organization like five times that night. Me, you want to know the sad part? My parents can answer each and every one of those questions, and they've known your son a fraction of the time you have. Oh. Cue to the screaming in Spanish, being yelled at in a foreign language by a non-native speaker is a surreal experience. Obviously, my husband comes in and yells back, and it blows up even more. But the part that stand out, stands out is the fact that father-in-law still refused to admit that he just hadn't taken a genuine interest in my husband in years. Like, bruh, you don't even know your kid's favorite color. Hello? Now my husband is contemplating going no, no contact, and I can't blame him. My creepy gym teacher pulled the most disgusting stunt the day before he retired, and gets instant karma. We had a basketball coach who was pretty well loved by our entire school. He was one of those teachers that would let you skip class and would never snitch. He was basically a teacher that everyone thought of as a student, and a teacher all of the kids would go to tell all the drama to, especially the girls. All the girls in the school had a crush on him, and I will admit, from one guy to another he was pretty handsome for his age. Everyone knew this was his last year, and he has been saying for the past couple of months that he was going to throw a little party on his last day teaching and we were all super excited. Fast forward to his last day of school, he told the under 18s girls basketball team he'd be bringing in a treat for them to say thank you for being such wonderful students, and also mentioned that he had a different treat for the boys. This seemed like a lovely gesture, but it was a bit strange that he had a different for both genders. When the Friday rolled around he handed each of the girls a chocolate, and the boys had pizza. Innocent, simple, yet sweet and thoughtful. Or so everyone thought. These chocolates actually turned out to be a specific type of chocolate that was supposed to increase the intimacy drive of couples to enhance their bedroom experience, containing various ingredients known to boost hormones, and turning anyone on almost instantly. Nobody rejected these chocolates, as they didn't want to be rude to this old teacher who brought them a sweet gift. Fast forward 20 minutes, the girls are all in a state of panic. Some of them weren't sure what was happening to them, and assumed something was wrong, and so they went to the nurse. Meanwhile, the changing room was filled with these girls either making out, or in the showers doing god knows what. Some girls had even texted boys from the school who were more than happy to come out of class and meet them in the school bathroom. One girl, however, had been given an extra dab's chocolate out of the kindness of this old man's heart. This meant she was twice as ready to go as any of the girls getting it on in the locker rooms. Long story short, this was the girl the basketball coach had chosen out of a lot. The two were found in the disabled bathrooms when the principal went to do a roll call to find out where all the girls had gone to. Many of the girls were caught in the act and expelled, but this teacher was arrested in front of everybody as they escorted him into a cop car. He announced, I have enjoyed my time teaching you all. I am glad I was able to teach you all one very important lesson. Don't take candy from strangers. My insane ex-boyfriend thought he could mess with my drink to make me loopy and drowsy, but he got way more than he bargained for. 
I dated Nathan in high school for two years and he and I were super similar, we were co-presidents of the same clubs, and had similar academic portfolios, but for some reason, he always made it a point to compete with me. One time, we got put in the same group for a project, and I was really excited to spend more time with my boyfriend, but instead of being happy, he told me, lucky you, getting put in the same group as me, no need to thank me ahead of time for doing all of the work. Regardless, those were years that I really valued and enjoyed because Nathan took all my firsts. We talked about going to Harvard together. I wanted to spend my college life with him, so that became my dream. I made sure not to be outdone by him, and wanted for both of us to get accepted. But once the time for college applications rolled around, he did something unbelievable. Nathan dumped me out of nowhere, saying that he needed to focus if he wanted to get into Harvard and he couldn't be distracted by me. I was heartbroken because he just called our two-year relationship a distraction, and could get over me so quickly. But our college applications were coming up, so I didn't even have time to cry over it. Instead, a fire lit inside of me and all I wanted to do was get into Harvard to show Nathan that I wasn't just a distraction. But all our tests were already over and the only event left before our applications was an international debate competition in DC. I had been preparing for this for months because this was my final chance to prove that I belonged at an Ivy League school. Everyone was tense, including me and Nathan. But I could have never prepared myself for the lengths he would go to just to beat me. It first started on the train to DC when Nathan changed seats so that we would be next to each other. It was very awkward, but I thought that this was just Nathan's way of trying to apologize for breaking up with me like that, so I ended up letting my guard down. For the remainder of the trip, Nathan tried acting like a friend. That train ride, he treated me like he used to while we were still dating. He complimented how determined I looked, and even offered to listen to my speech as practice. In fact, he made me think that he regretted his decision and wanted to make things right during this competition. By the end of the train ride, things almost felt normal, and it felt natural when Nathan showed up to my hotel room the next morning with a cup of coffee for me. I happily drank the coffee and thanked him for worrying about me. That was until I noticed something had changed in me. About halfway through the first day of the conference, I felt like I was in a hyper-focused mode, as if someone had filtered out the white noise in my brain and just left the sharpest, most productive parts behind. When I gave impromptu speeches, I found myself having extra time to think as if time was going by slightly slower than usual. And when the time for questions came, I asked the most precise, detail-oriented questions that highlighted major flaws in my opponent's arguments. Somehow, I was beating everyone in the debate room, including Nathan. By the second night, it was obvious that I was going to win. I thought he would be agitated and mad that he didn't do as well as me, and wouldn't talk to me anymore. But to my surprise, the next morning he showed up in front of my door with another cup of coffee. He looked a bit pissed off, and told me that I should drink it as soon as possible, but I didn't think much of it. And once again, I ended up destroying everyone in the competition. On the fourth and final day of the competition, everything was even more tense than usual. My anxiety only grew when Nathan failed to deliver me a morning coffee. I tried not to think anything of it initially because it could have just been a coincidence, but then, Nathan didn't show up to the debate at all. He completely skipped the final day of the competition. That's when I knew something was wrong. I ran to his hotel room the second the committee session ended. After banging on his door for five minutes straight, he finally let me in. But the moment I stepped inside, Nathan exploded at me, asking how it was possible for me to be performing so well. I was going to make a lighthearted joke because I genuinely had no idea how I managed to improve so much in just four days. Everything that happened during this conference put all my other work these past four years to shame, which was saying a lot. But I never got a word out, because Nathan immediately went on a chauvinistic, narcissistic tangent and revealed something truly insane. He had been trying to sabotage me from the very first day. Apparently he felt that this competition was the perfect thing to round out his application, and he really wanted it on his LinkedIn biography so he could call himself an international debate champion. The coffee that he gave me was laced and was supposed to make me not function at all. At least that's what he thought. Nathan told me that he had tried to intentionally buy me coffee with psychedelics and legal psilocybin alternatives in it, hoping that it would make me loopy, distracted, and confused. But it turns out that the coffee he had given me was the opposite of psychedelics. If anything, it was focus-enhancing, and I felt ultra-productive. I asked Nathan for the exact coffee brand he had bought and looked it up to confirm what I already knew, that the coffee he bought had nothing to do with psychedelics, and was simply a mushroom coffee fusion blend. It was called Clarity Brew, and from the name I could sort of understand why Nathan might think that it was for a psychedelic type of clarity. But the actual product description made it clear that this coffee was a blessing, not a curse. The mushrooms Nathan had thought would hurt my chances of winning this competition were chaka mushrooms and lion's mane, which botanists will know are just cognitive power banks for the mind. I respected Nathan wholeheartedly until this point, but never in my life did I think that he would be capable of such a low-level IQ move. And even though Nathan had basically tried to poison me with this coffee, it worked so well on me that once I was done yelling at him, I took the clarity brew with me to confiscate it only to bring it all the way home so I could continue using the coffee until the end of senior year. That was when I discovered that the coffee didn't just make me more productive, it gave me long-lasting energy and naturally minimized the jittery effects of caffeine. Nathan had basically bought me super coffee in an attempt to drag me down. To no one's surprise, I won the competition and was later accepted to Harvard. In my interview, I revealed what had happened during the competition and they decided to reject Nathan. We still text sometimes, and he's apologized a lot for what he did. 
I've even started connecting him to a few people at Harvard to help him out with some research opportunities because I just want to be the bigger person here. Hopefully one day, he'll be the same way. Edit. Okay wait, thanks so much for all the comments, I think you guys are right about him just using me for networking. I've decided to block Nathan and cut contact with him permanently, because you're right, he lost the privilege of being my friend the day he tried to drug me. My self-conscious sister got called mediocre looking by our mother and is now hurting herself, my mother won't admit that what she did was wrong. My sister is 14 years old and very self-conscious of her looks. She has acne like any normal 14 year old and has a very normal body type, but she does have a pretty face and is overall a fairly attractive girl in the least weird way possible. However, like any chronically online 14-year-old girl, she suffers from body dysmorphia and self-consciousness due to the amount of social media influencer content she consumes which crushes her self-esteem. She looks at pictures of models in bikinis or professional photoshoots, then goes in the mirror to compare herself and pick her own appearance apart. It hurts me to see this as her older brother, and I try to explain to her that social media is all lies, that this is not how those models look all the time but she refuses to listen to me. My mother also does a very poor job of helping my sister overcome her self-esteem issues. She has made jokes to my sister about her acne, using the overused pepperoni pizza or connect the dots comments to get a laugh. This never got a laugh out of my sister though, it would only make her cry. I remember just last month my mother made a comment about my sister grabbing a second slice of cake at my birthday while knowing my sister deals with body image issues, and my sister has only worn oversized hoodies around her since then. I asked her to at least apologize to my sister, but she says she has nothing to apologize for. In my mother's words, if she thinks she's so fat, maybe she shouldn't grab a second slice of cake. I told my mother that her brutal honesty can hurt at times and it isn't the best way to go about helping people deal with issues. My mother ended up scoffing at telling me that people back in her day weren't as sensitive. I never mentioned this comment of hers to my sister of course. Instead I tried talking to my sister about why the comment made her so upset, and she said that it validated everything she felt. I suggested therapy or counseling for her, but she said she's not willing to go to it. However, after yesterday's events I think she's going to have too. Yesterday was a particularly bad body image day for my sister. She said she felt bloated and puffy, and that her acne had only gotten worse. She was feeling very down and decided that she would go to her mom and vent to her. I was in school at this time so she couldn't go to me. She ended up very honestly asking her mother what she thinks of her appearance. Whether or not she's actually pretty, fat, skinny, whatever it is. And so my mother decided it would be a good thing to once again be brutally honest as that's how things were back in the day. She went on to tell my sister, word for word, I think you're mediocre looking, your face isn't ugly but isn't special and to be honest you are a little chubby not gonna lie. My sister said that when she heard that she left the room and didn't say a word after. Once I found out I went to talk to my mother immediately about how wrong of her that was to say, but she once again stated, she wanted an honest answer and she got it. I told my mother that she was going to be the reason that our sister ends up with serious psychological issues and even eating disorders, but my mother stated that those aren't even real. I think my mother's words affected my sister much more than she realizes, as it's been over 24 hours since she spoke with her and my sister refuses to eat. I also noticed a scar on my sister's arm which seems to be very fresh and brand new. I have to get her help ASAP.